The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to a new episode of The Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker in New York, and we're talking cocktails and food this episode. So I hope you're hungry because we've got quite an episode for you. But before we get there, you know, I love to sort of dig into a good old cocktail. Well, I've got something rather special. You know, you've heard me talk about ransom spirits before. Well, I've made myself a delicious cocktail with one of their bourbons. It's their ransom bourbon. And, you know, I've got the bottle here. I'm holding this bottle in front of me. Well, I, I'm going to describe it to all of you who are listening. And by the way, if you're listening and you want to watch, you can you can actually check us out on YouTube and all the episodes. You can you can watch them. You can see us in in person, um, and you can see what I'm talking about. But I'll describe it to all of you who are listening. They have these great bottles. They really are old school prohibition style um, bottles with a nice weighted bottom, really great sort of shape to them, and they really fabulous uh, sort of labels. So you feel like you got some contraband in your hand, which is which is really really fun. And one of the things I love, and I'm gonna if you can hear this when I open it, you hear that little sound, little slight pop there. Their bourbon is is fabulous, and it's it, they do something kind of unique with their bourbon. In as much as most bourbon is made with three grains, they use four. So we're all familiar with barley, and you know they also use corn, rye, and wheat. And you really, when you taste, and I've made a cocktail, but I'm going to tell you about the actual, um, the actual bourbon first. It's absolutely delicious, super sort of sweet, but not too sweet. A little bit of spice. The spice comes from the rye. The sweet comes from the corn um, and the barley. And then you get that wheat, which just rounds it off and smooths it off. And, you know, they have an interesting process with you know they everything is, is is for example their barley they grow on their own organic farms so it's organic barley which i love that too um and they're based in oregon in a place called sheridan oregon on their on this organic farm it's where they make it all and the actual bourbon uh is made in french copper alembic sti pot stills <laughs> gotta get that out spit that out which Okay, sounds like, you know, like that sounds extraordinary, but it actually is quite extraordinary. It's not easy to do. That is the old school way of making bourbon and people don't do that very much anymore. The big, big batch bourbons are not made that way. And what it means is there's a lot of attention to detail. Um, you, you can't take your eyes off it. Imagine boiling a pot of water and walking away uh, and for sort of forgetting about it. The, the water boils off and you could basically burn your pan or, you know, ruin whatever you're cooking if you walked away from it. It's a very similar thing when you're using these alembic pot stills. You have to keep your eye on the game, and they, it means attention to detail is is sort of primary there. Um, so it's one of the things I love about it. Now I've made something kind of a little unique. I, I'm sort of you know wanted something a little warming. It's still pretty cold here, um, and although it's not a warm cocktail, the bourbon milk um, and nutmeg that I have in here, along with maple syrup makes it something rather special. It's a bit of a punch, um, sort of milkshake mash type of thing going on here. But essentially, I used the ransom bourbon, I used um, two ounces in a shaker with ice with two ounces of milk. And I like full fat milk people. If you use, um, you know, half, if you use like 2% or whatever, you know, yeah, it's healthier for you, but you're not going to get that creamy, delicious taste. Uh, you know, my wife doesn't like milk so she was asking me if i could make a one with sort of a creamy almond milk and i you can i mean that's will also work and if you get the barista version then it's much creamier and even more delicious i like to use maple syrup some people like to use powdered sugar but maple syrup for me and I, the maple syrup i have actually comes from our own trees again I, I'm, I'm a little spoiled but that works and i also put in about a teaspoon of vanilla extract shake that up Pour it into your glass, into a coop. That's what I'm using, classic old coop. Sprinkle some nutmeg on top, and I floated a star anise. And if you want, you can even stick a stick of cinnamon in there. How about that? So cheers. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be a real foodie episode. So we're starting off with a rather delicious cocktail. Mm -mm -mm. And I would be amiss if before I got to my guest, I didn't start with this, but I have had you know been getting headaches and migraines for years by the way and recently i've been able to get them under control and in large part because 
I realized that in certain situations, um, red wine and wine in general was triggering headaches. Now, I, you know, say, well, how is this booze news? Well, that, you know, you may have read a lot about natural wines um, that don't have sulfites. And this is something I thought it was perhaps the sulfites because that's what I'd heard and read. Um, and I was avoiding not all wines, but I was also drinking some natural wines and I was enjoying them very much. And occasionally I would get, still get a headache, not a migraine necessarily, but I was like, you know, I wanted to dig into this deeper. And there's a lot of people who've been saying in the natural wine world that it's the sulfites that perhaps are giving you the hangover or the headache. And if you if you cut that out and you drink a natural organic wine, that's not going to happen. Now, apparently, um, it turns out that, ev that the, the, they've done some research. And if anything, the contrary is true. <laughs> OK, so they're now saying that Sulfites, whether they're, and by, by the way, sulfites occur naturally on the grape skin. It's a, it's a part of the fermentation process, but it's also, they add additional sulfites, and you can do this at any stage in winemaking. And, um, you know, it's apparently, the, the, it's not the sulfites, but it is in fact something which is called, let me just get to my notes here. Um, it is something which is called, it's, it's the histamines rather. So it's the histamines in wine which are actually far worse for you than the sulfites and they, they call them BA which is biogenic amines um, BA is the easier way of saying it and, and it's these these group of compounds which are actually uh, the reason and the cause for people to get headaches not the sulfites so you know if, if we're able to sort of separate the, the, the these BAs from the wine then we'd be on to something but I guess it, what this is, is sort of saying to a lot of people that beware if you think you're going to get away from having a headache natural wine is perhaps not the way to go and and in fact by increasing sulfites what they've noticed is and there's a, a particular person called uh, the master of wine sophie parker thompson um who has done a lot of research and i guess she's saying that in fact wine that has more sulfites in it actually reduces the amount of aim these bas these um amines that we're talking about which give you the headache so increased sulfite might actually give you a wine which will won't give you a headache so there you go riddle me that people so anyway there's your booze news that was news for me it's going to make a bit big, big difference to my life i'm going to look search for those ba and low histamine uh wines now going forward and if you find some out there dm me uh go to at shaken and stirred on instagram and by the way you should be following us already and DM me the best wines that you found out there. I'd love to know if you find some great wines that don't give you a headache, because that's what I'm onto. That's why it's okay, I'm drinking a bourbon today. Now, we have a fabulous guest. Our guest this week is the Mexican-born chef who's the heart and brains behind an award-winning contemporary Latin restaurant group, which successfully owns and operates over 45 restaurant concepts around the world. Please welcome Chef Richard Sandoval. Chef, how are you? And thanks for coming on the Shaken and Stirred show. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Very well. Cheers, first of all. What, what are you drinking? I'm, I'm drinking here uh, uh, one of our signature cocktails here. Um, it's made with uh, Danzantes Mezcal, late harvest wine, a little Aperol, um, you know, some, some raspberries, a little uh, bitters, and that's it. Uh, you know, it's uh, one of our signature drinks here at the, at the Four Seasons in Punta Mita. I, I, I love it that you're like, that's it. Which, by the way, that was how many ingredients did you just listed just then? Like six or something like that? About, I mean, about, about, about five different uh, ingredients here. Fantastic. I love a little Aperol. That's a little unusual with the, with the mezcal. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, you know, here in, in Mexico, you know, we always drink mezcal with, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, orange, a little bit of uh, tajin, which is, uh, you know, some chili powder, um, a little bit of, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, special, uh, you know, salt made from the gusano de maguey, which is, you know, right. it's a, you know, so I think orange goes very well with that. So I think the apple, you know, kind of really mixes and blends really well with this cocktail. No, it's funny because actually, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is orange versus lime, you know, because obviously in the US and sort of globally, 
people sort of lean towards lime, but clearly margaritas and various other things have this triple sec, this orange liqueur in them. And so there is a, you know, but, we, but we, then we don't necessarily put it in our, our tequila. And I recently interviewed um, the people over at Sincoro Tequila, and they recommended it was actually you know, Michael Jordan, apparently it's his drink, it's his tequila. He likes a, a slice of orange and that's it in the, his tequila. So what are you, a lime or orange man? I'm a lime. You're alive. You're alive. There you go. Yeah. After all that, he's the light. Thank you. OK, good, because he was making me feel like I was a moron. But that, so tell me, what is that? So what is this dispute between the two I mean, and why you know, the orange versus the lime? And how do you think it complements it? Well, I mean, I think it's like food. I mean, I think it's all about you know, your personal palate. Do you like it a little bit sweeter? Do you like it a little bit more acidic? Um, you know, and, and I mean, actually, you know, I prefer both. You know, I like the acidic, but I also like the sweetness of the orange. Um, I think, you know, on this one specific, because it has mezcal, I would prefer the orange because I think the smokiness goes well with the orange. If I was drinking tequila, it would probably be, kind, you know, the lime I think would, would uh, you know, contrast better, you know. So, so I think it's all about, you know, personal taste and, you know, your, and your personal palate, right? A hundred percent. I mean, let's talk tequila for a moment here, as that's where we've started. But, you know, clearly there's been a, a global boom in tequila and, and it keeps on booming. And, you know, one thinks that you've hit a saturation point, but no matter what, there's still when you look at the global sales of tequila, it's still a fraction of perhaps, you know, the, the vodkas of this world, you know, and, and the whiskies of this world. So there's still room for movement, but there are so many different brands. And certainly in the US, it's a very, very popular drink. Were you surprised by this boom? And, and you know, what's your sort of general take on it? And how is it affecting Mexico? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, like you said, I mean, it, it, hold, it still holds such a small market share of the global sales of spirits. So I think people are seeing, you know, you know, the opportunity. Again, I think when you think Mexican food, I think it's one of the top more, you know, five more popular foods in the world. Mexican food, I think, is very festive. You know, there's, it's always... You know, integrated to you know to spirits, unlike you know other cuisines. I mean, French, you, you think wine, right? Italian, you probably think wine. I think Mexican, you think tequila, you, you, you think mezcal, and again, so I think that's why you know, it's such an important integral part of who we are as as a culture. Um, and again, you know, it, 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 it's there's such a, a small share that tequila and mezcal hold today. So people are still seeing. I mean, you know, this 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 opportunity for growth as you know as as we, we gain more market share. So I think that there's still a huge opportunity there. What do you look for in a tequila? Again, I mean, I think it, 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 they're, they're all so different, you know, whether it's a blanco, whether it's a, an añejo, a reposado. You know, if, if I'm drinking a, a, a cocktail, I would probably use a blanco because, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's cleaner. It's, um, you know, it's distilled in, in, uh, in a, you know, aluminum, you know, bad. So it's, it's kind of clean and crisp. You know, if I'm going to sip it, you know, I would for sure go for an añejo or a reposado. So again, it's, it all depends on how you're going to, you know, drink it. You know, I think, you know, tequila, you know, going back 20 years ago, you know, er, you know every, everybody talked about their, their tequila stories, right? In, in Mexico, shooting it and, you know, what, you know, what happened with tequila stayed with tequila, right? Because we all did crazy things with, with tequila because, you know, we were just, you know, we were shooting it. And, you know, after the 12th shot, you know, it takes you to, you know, to, to a different place. Um, so again, it, it's all, you know, what, what, what you're doing with it and how you know you want to sip it again you know fast forward 10 15 years people are sipping it you know some are, are aged in you know you know french oak you know they're uh, you know 12 months 15 months two years three years and then every you know every maker you know gets a different uh you know characteristic and so again it's all about your personal preference and, and what you're going to specifically do with that tequila i i again i prefer if i'm doing a cocktail i prefer you know a blanco to sip you know i, I love you know i love añejos Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a sort of right in the middle. I'm a reposado kind of guy, generally speaking. Although I did have some Anejo last night, which was fabulous. And I've been enjoying some extra Anejos. Um, I think it's a 30 month uh, old uh, Cinco right. that I was sent, which was which was fabulous. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, and I've visited Mexico many times. And I guess the culture of tequila in Mexico is quite different to the culture of tequila in the, say the, the, the US certainly and I'm based in, in New York you know what does tequila really mean to the people of Mexico do you think that it, 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 how does what does it symbolize for them I mean you know obviously I mean it, 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 it was a drink of the Mayans you know of our, of our of this Mayan civilization so I think it was the god of you know the drink of the gods so I think it, it's instilled in us it's part of our cultures it's part of you know who we are 
Um, and again, I mean, it's, you know, it's for us, it was always meant to be sipped, you know, celebrated, you know, drank with family and friends. Um, you know, I think it just, you know, as tourists came to, you know, to Acapulco and to the nightclubs, and I think it, you know, it took a different, a different trend. And I think that's what made it famous, you know, outside of Mexico was, you know, everybody was, you know, shooting it, sipping it, you know, not sipping it. And everybody was doing crazy things. And so, you know, people, you know, started, you know, you know, really, you know, kind of, you know, drinking it. Um, but again, to Mexico, it, it, it's part of our DNA, you know, right. and, 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 and we sip it, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily shoot it. Well, you know, I got to say, my first kiss with my wife was, in fact, a tequila shot um, <laughs> 27 years ago, which was I'm not sure if you've heard of the tequila body shot, which is where you lick the neck, put the salt on the neck, stick the lime in the mouth. And then you people, you you lick the salt back off, you do the shot, and then you remove the lime from the mouth. And inevitably, you're, you're lip to lip at some point. So uh, the Mexicans know a thing or two when it comes to partying and, and, and you know, really using every aspect of it. Now, I, I've got a question for you here on the tequila front again which is is it fact or fiction when it comes to tequila and you may or may not know but uh, being an upper they people talk about tequila being one of the only uppers and i've always wondered how and why is it is it an upper yeah i mean i, I mean i think at the end at the end of the day i mean you know they, they all contain ethanol which is alcohol so I, I think they all i mean a lot of it i think is myth and people right. But I think, you know, every, everybody reacts differently. You know, I get it, I get it, again, it probably depends on the mood that you're in, how it affects your mood. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, for, for sure, for me, it was, you know, it was, it was a great, it was an opera, you know? And, you know, and I've gone through stages where, you know, I, I was a vodka drinker, I was a rum drinker, um, you know, then, you know, I was tequila and, you know, and more mezcal. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's probably a myth, I would say. I don't know, what are your thoughts? No, uh, interesting enough. So I'm, I, I, when you logically think it through, it's a myth, right? It has to be right. a myth because like you, you mentioned, it's, al it's alcohol at the end of the day. And so that is a downer, right? In theory, right? Ethanol is, is a downer. But and people will argue that it's the agave and it's the whatever. But I, from just from experience, from someone who has, you know, been drinking most of his life and, and is someone who is very familiar with a lot of alcohols, tequila makes me feel different. And I, you know, I can tell you that if I have a shot of tequila or, or drinking tequila, I definitely feel in a fun party laughing kind of mood. It has a different vibe, whether it's an upper or a downer versus if you're going to drink a bourbon or a whiskey or, you know, or something very simple and plain like a vodka or even a gin. Right. So it, it does. There is something there, whether it's a myth or not a myth or a complete fact or whatever. Uh, perhaps it's each individual has their own their own take on it. But that would be mine on it. Now, what, what about Right, you know, obviously I said, what do you look for in a tequila? What should people avoid? And I know that it's all down to taste, as you've mentioned a couple of times, but what, what do you avoid rather, I think is perhaps a better question. What, what do you look for when you're getting a tequila? I know what you might want, but what would you not want to, for people to look at or, or, try, or buy perhaps? I mean, I, you know, I, I think a lot of tequila distillers, you know, you know take shortcuts. Um, so, you know, you, know, you, you know, make sure it's 100% agave. You know, um, also, um, you know, you know, some distilleries, you know, use caramel to give it color. Um, so again, I, just to making sure it's it's, uh, you know, a distillery with a good reputation. Um, you know, and again, yeah, they're, they're not are those bad things. Sorry, are those bad things? You, you obviously, like you're mentioning caramel. Like you, one might think, and obviously, the, the hundred percent agave or blue agave, that sounds definitely important. But is it is it wrong to perhaps use caramel? Is it wrong to have a bit of vanilla in it? I know, and I know people purists will say, "Well, absolutely." But then, if there are so many tequilas out there, how are they all differentiating themselves if they're not doing a little caramel here and there and other things? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think as as long as it's, it's used in the right proportions, I think the problem, and, and, and we all know this. I mean, you drink a very inexpensive tequila. I mean, you right. you, you get a horrible hangover. I mean, right. I, I, I know that for a fact, you know, when I, you know, when I, when I, when I drink the premiums that, you know, the, the hundred percent agaves, you know, the next day, you know, it's, it, it's okay. So I, I think, you know, sometimes they, they say sugar, but you know, what kind of sugars are they using? You know, is it, uh, you know, is it brown sugar? Is it sugar that's been processed? So I think mm -hmm. a lot of, it's like, it's like food, right? I mean, you know, your, your body, it's, it's, it's like a car, you know, it's, it's a gas tank, right? It's, it's your fuel. If you put in a car, you know, bad fuel, you know, it's, you know, sorry, the engine starts to shake, 
I think the same thing with our bodies, you know, some of these distilled processes that they go through, I mean, they cut corners and, you know, to, to gain time or, 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 or you know, or get, you know, flake, uh, fake flavor profiles. And then I think it affects the end product. So as long as you're, you know, you're using it for the right reasons and, and using the right product, I, I, I think it's okay. You mentioned food, let's sort of move into the food direction here. But, you know, when it comes to sort of food and tequila, you, you know, you mentioned earlier, it's the perhaps, perhaps where in France people are drinking a wine or perhaps in Germany, they've got a beer. Um, you know, what do you recommend really pairs best with tequila? I mean, obviously Mexican food in general, but you know, it seems to me that it seems like almost a, a strong, it's a, it's, a, it's a liquor, right? So do, do one, do we really drink a liquor with food or is, te, is tequila something that perhaps people should drink before food or after food or does it really pair with food? And if so, which? I mean, I think typically, I think tequila is before food kind of to right. op open up your appetite and, and you know, and, and build, you know, your, your expectation towards your, you know, your meal. Um, you know, sipping a, a nice añejo, I think is, all, you know, or, or reposado, I, I think is good because it, it'll stand up to, you know, obviously Mexican food is very bold I and mean, it has strong flavors. So I, I think, you know, um, you know, a nice añejo, I think, you know, you can sip and it'll pair well with it. And obviously, you know, you, today you also, you know, you have, you know, a, a Jamaica, you know, you know, tequila. So, so you have, you know, what we call digestivos, you know, also, you know, but but with different, uh, you know, flavor profile. And, and again, I mean, I think it's all in the eye of the beholder, you know, and, and I, as I like to say, in the palate of the beholder, you know, it's all what you like. Mexico today is producing great wines. I think, you know, great wines go better with a great meal than, than, you, than you say, than, than a spirit. I mean, spirit is, 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 is very strong, you know? So I think, you know, you need, you need to, you know, to, to balance food with, uh, you know, with, with a good wine. So like every, you know, every cuisine, you know, I think in Mexico, you know, wine sales have grown leaps and bounds over the last five years. And, you know, Mexicans, as Mexicans, you know, we started to learn and appreciate, you know, great wines, you know, with, with a great meal. Now, you've got multiple restaurants and food establishments around the world, and you're clearly selling wine, tequila and everything else and cocktails to all your, all your guests. Do you see, is it important for you that they are drinking Mexican wine um, versus perhaps French wine or, or, or American wine or whatever um, at the table or does, for you, does it not really matter? And how do you pair your, your meals together? No, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, I, I think people should eat what, what they like to eat and what, you know, what, what, what their preference. I mean, you're, you're paying for a meal. I mean, why is someone going to dictate to me what, you know, it's like when you go to Italian restaurants, and they tell you, you know, if you're eating seafood, you know, don't put don't put Parmesan. I mean, fuck, if, if, sorry for my language. If I like Parmesan cheese, because I, you know, again, to me, like, like a, it's it's almost like a seasoning. It's, it's I want a little bit of salt. There's a little bit of creaminess. You know, it's it's not about the Parmesan cheese. You know, as, as I look at chilies in Mexican cuisine, to me, it's an enhancement of my dish. So you know, it can't necessarily you know, people say, well, you know, what's the heat level? It's a, is it a nine or a ten? You know, I don't look at heat that way because it'll ruin my whole meal. If, if it's a 10, you know, your, your mouth will be burning. So I, I think, it, you know, food, it's all about personal preferences. So yeah, I mean, I, I like people to experience Mexican wines because it's something different. I think life is about experimenting and tasting new things. So yeah, for me, it's people to, you know, experience my culture and, you know, taste the, the wine from the Valle de Guadalupe, which they're making amazing wines today. But yeah, I mean, I, I can't say, you know, you know, Mexican goes better with uh, Bordeaux or Mexican goes better with, uh, you know, Malbec. I think it's all about personal preferences. But what I do know is that Mexican, you know, you know, I, I think you need, you know, Pinots or Malbecs to really stand up to, you know, the, the, the bold, you know, flavor. So I would say it's more the varietals than, than it will be a, a specific region. First of all, I got to say, I take my hat off for you for being as humble as possible. I must have interviewed, I can't tell you, countless chefs. <laughs> my, right. uh, over the and I, I don't think I'm very. I've almost never heard a chef say that it, you know it's sort of up to the individual and personal taste, which I think is fabulous, by the way, because I'm with you on that. I am one of those people who quite often likes to put parmesan on my pasta with fish, or and and or whatever, and I'll be looked at and frowned at by the waiter, and I've, I've even been told no, actually, at various restaurants, well, they will not give it to you at all, and will just simply not, or they'll put, you know, the black pepper, and you'll ask for a little bit more, and they'll just frown, or no, you can't have salt, we don't serve salt, because the chef has already salted the food, and this is it, 
that's how you have it. You know, and I, I, I understand the art form and what have you, but th there is also the fact that everyone's palate is slightly different. And that part of it's never taken into account for. Some of us have saltier palates than others, and some people like things to be certain other ways. So thank you. <laughs> no wonder you've got us very successful in a series of restaurants because people can actually go and enjoy themselves. It's not about this necessarily about the chef. It's about the whole experience, which is wonderful. Is that a part of your ethos? Is that where you, what you wanted to create with your restaurants? Yes, absolutely. I, again, I mean, you know, we, we create food for people to love what we do. I mean, we're not here to dictate, you know, for people what to eat. You know, everybody's palate is formed and experienced different things as, as a child. So you know, your taste buds are, you know, made different because uh, of, of whatever you experience as a child. So you can't tell someone because I say that you have to eat an habanero this way, that that's how you're going to enjoy it. No, I mean, the, the mind and, and the palate will, will not register that. So again, I think it's all about, you know, people enjoying the experience and, and feeling comfortable at the restaurant. You know, I think, you know, wine's a perfect example of, of why people were scared of wines because everybody told, you know, told them what they had to drink, what they had to, you know, drink it with. And, and, and you can't do that because again, I mean, it's, you know, like art, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, the same thing with the palate. It's, it's in the palate's, you know, person's um, unique, uniqueness of, of his palate, you know, what he wants to eat, how he should eat it. And at the end of the day, what is it going to taste like? And I think you're right saying that I think I've been successful because I've created restaurants, not for Richard Sandoval, but for what I think people, you know, will enjoy in that experience of what they're going to be eating. Yeah, amazing. And you mentioned sort of childhood a moment ago. And I, I mean, take us back for a moment to your your childhood. And what was it? You know, what was it? You know, like your childhood, and and how did you first get really excited by the whole cooking experience and, and want to get into this in the first place? Right. Well, you know, um, you know, I grew up in my grandmother's house as a kid, and so. You know, my grandfather was a banker and so you know they entertain a lot so i remember as a, as, a, as a, you know at a very young age you know exper experimenting with you know this is going back 35 years ago in mexico city where you know there wasn't you know you didn't have foreign cheeses you don't you didn't have you know you know butters up you know for, for you know for, from europe and they were bringing these things to you know to to cater to the, to their friends so, so my palate was very was being formed at a very young age and experience all these different flavors. And that's what I like to say is not that I'm better or, or you know, I, I think I was very fortunate as a kid to experience different things that most chefs probably didn't get to experience and their palate wasn't exposed to many things. So I think that gave me an edge as, you know, when I started, you know, to travel and grow up and eventually become a chef, I think, you know, someone up there was already, already you know, preparing my palate for what my career was going to be. So again, I was exposed, you know, to my grandmother's cooking um, you know, it was all about family re reunions on Saturdays and Sundays. You know, it was, you know, it was family style. Um, you know, she was a, the, the matriarch of the family. She would sit at the head of the table. The cooks would bring platters and then she would serve and the, the food would, would get, you know, passed you know, along the table. And then, and I also remember at a very young age going into the kitchen with her cooks and, you know, she was in there. They were always tasting everything. You know, I think, you know, chefs sometimes, you know, do not taste food, you know, and, you know, it's like the, the famous saying, you know, you, you, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. You know, a lot of people think that because you took a great book from a great chef and you took the recipe and you followed it to the T, you're going to come out with that exact chef, you know, exact dish from that chef. And that's not the, and then you get pissed off because that's not the case. You know, ingredients change, you know, you know, they're, they're sometimes, you know, they're, they're vine ripe and sometimes they're not. So there's more sweetness or less sweetness or more acidic, they're spicier. So I, I've always taught all my cooks and, and people that, that I work with, you know, cook with your palate. You know, a recipe is a guideline and then use that and, you know, enhance it and take it and make sure at the end it, it, it's well balanced. You know, I think food is, is, is about that balance. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I tell people the same thing with cocktails. I mean, you know, there'll be a recipe, but you have to figure it out. Like even with a classic, like a Negroni, I'm someone who, you know, the, the one, one, one measure is what everyone, you know, taught, right. ta ta taunts and says, that's how you meant to drink it. But I actually prefer two measures of gin to my Campari and, and perhaps even less sweet vermouth because I'm just not someone who likes something too sweet, but I, that, that, that works best for me. So absolutely figure it out. And, and, you know, so was there something, was there a dish that really piqued your imagination when you were a kid, something your grandmother made, or that was like, okay, this is that you, that you remember to this day that you just love. I think there was two things. I think, you know, one of them was mole poblano, mm. uh, you know, mm. which, which to me should have been one of the mother sauces and it was made with chocolate. 
and I was like, what the hell, is, what are they thinking? You know, what, what, what is she doing? You know, but, but the end dish that they came out, I mean, it was this subtle, balanced, sweet, spicy, you know, uh, very dynamic, uh, just, it was, it was, you know, a roller coaster of flavors. And, you know, kind of what I tell people today, my cooking is that it's a, it's a roller coaster of flavors. And I think mole is kind of what gave me that, you know, that, that flavor, you know, and once I tasted it, I was like, wow, you know, what is this? And this, this thing is magical. And, it, you know, so, so mole, I think, you know, is one of my favorite things, you know, that, you know, I learned, you know, from my grandmother. And then I, I, there's this recipe that I still use today, which is a corn cake. Um, you know, obviously corn is, you know, our, just like tequila is the, you know, the, the spirit of the gods, you know, corn is, you know, it's, it's, all, it's one of the main ingredients in our culture. I mean, you make tortillas out of it, you know, tortillas, we eat with everything in, in Mexico, but she made this amazing, you know, you know, corn cake made out, made out of corn. And it was just, I mean, it, it was almost like, uh, I mean, it was very moist, um, but, but mm. dense. Um, but just, you know, the flavors of it were just, you know, spectacular. And I still have it today, you know, at some of my wrestling and people are just blown away by, you know, the, you know, the, the amazing texture and flavor of, you know, this, this yellow corn cake. The, I, the, I know the, 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 the process of making tortillas it can be quite arduous. I think people take it for granted when they see the sort of flat piece of bread that they're eating their, tor <laughs> you know, their, their, their food in and just sort of assume. But, you know, I, I was speaking to the, this lady who works with me in our house and she, she grew, grew up making tortillas when she was as little as five years old and talks about the, you know, would have to make basically over a hundred of them a day, I think maybe more, uh, you know, right. the grinding of the corn and then the, the taking it to the, the local place in the village where they would then sort of, I guess, make the separation. But the, the, it's quite a process, isn't it? The making of the tortilla. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you said, I mean, the nixtamilizaciones, which you take the corn, you know, you marinate, you marinate kind of, um, you know, it, it releases is the starches. And then from there, you know, you take it to the local, uh, the grinder, and then, you know, he puts it through a grinder. And then, you know, you have to make, you know, then you make, you know, the, the, you get the dough, then you got to make the balls and you got to hand press them. So, yeah, so the whole process, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's time, it's, it's very time consuming, but the end product is, is amazing. It, it is amazing. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan. And, you know, I grew up in the UK and I'm, you know, my, my background personally is my parents, my, my mother is from Sri Lanka and uh, both my parents were born in India. Um, and I grew up with a lot of Indian food, clearly, and of obvious reasons, and, and Sri Lankan food, and it's very spicy and what have you. And you know, certainly growing up in the UK, there was, when I, in the 70s, I don't think I ever went to a Mexican restaurant. I, the very first time I went to a Mexican restaurant was I went to, when I arrived in New York in the early 90s and experienced Mexican food for the first time. And I remember thinking, first of all, thinking, well, what is all of this? And it was, but it reminded me of Indian food because of the color and the variety of the sauces and the and I'm like this is so unusual I'd never experienced this never tried these flavors they were unique flavors very different in many ways but at the same time a lot of similarities and I know you do a lot of fusion food and you kind of have mixed sort of you know Asian with Mexican or Latin food talk to me a little bit about you know your inspiration for that and and and, and how that all came about yeah so, so so yeah I mean I think there's a lot of foods that are you know, that are very similar that you can kind of, you know, you know, put together. Um, you know, I think that, that also the, 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 you know, the saying, you know, fusion is confusion is also very true. I mean, I, I don't think you can just take, you know, Italian and mix it with Mexican. And I, 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 I don't think it's what it would, would work, but you put Asian and Indian with Mexican. And, and I think, like you said, you know, the flavor profile is very different. You know, they use none, you know, we use tortillas, you know, um, they have, you know, they have the heat, you know, they, you know, rice is a big staple in, in their cuisine, like it is, like, like it is with us. So I think the flavor profiles, flavor profiles are very similar and can kind of be integrated, you know, to create something special. You know, I think, you know, Nobu did an amazing job, you know, when he lived in Peru to kind of, you know, fuse Japanese with Peruvian to get what, you know, what we know today as, as Nikkei. You know, in, in Peru, you also have the Chinese, you know, where, where you have chaufa, which is kind of Chinese with, with Peruvian. So, yeah, you know, I, I travel a lot, you know, as a, as, a, as a tennis player, you know, I wanted to be a professional tennis player, you know, so I traveled, you know, the world playing tennis and, you know, so I, I was exposed to all these cuisines and I was fascinated by, you know, how well, you know, the Nikkei, you know, you know, he started using serranos with his, you know, with his, you know, kind of sashimi, you know, so he came up with tiraditos, which I call sashimi with flavor. 
you know, um, and, and it just, you know, you, you build these amazing experiences. And again, I, I think, you know, Mexican food is so diverse and so unique that, that it can be fused with, 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 with other cuisines, but they have to be strong cuisines that can sustain, you know, the integration. I mean, I think if you put Mexican and French, I mean, you know, Mexican is going to blow it out of the water because, you know, French is, is more subtle. You know, it's more about, you know, great ingredients, but in, in Mexican is, is about being bold, you know, these strong flavors. So I think you just have to be smart about how you integrate them to make, to make sure that, that they make sense. I'm going to be sacrilegious here and, and tell everybody that I'm not actually a huge fan of French food. And it's not just because I'm English and I, you know, I can throw a stone at Paris from, from London. Um, <laughs> although, you know, hey, uh, but it, it's partly the creaminess of, and all the rest of it and the fuss that the French go into. It's just not my thing. And I, I've fallen in love with Mexican food. I am a huge, huge fan. Um, we have, you know, it's tequila and taco Tuesdays every day almost at my house most of the time so uh, and we you know there's a lo guy locally who makes the makes the tacos uh and makes the uh, you know the tortillas um fresh and so i, I they, they literally i get them hot and they're not fully cooked so i can just just finish off the cooking as at home so i'm right. all, i'm all i'm all about it by by the way you just dropped casually that you were sort of a pro tennis player or something just then which you know, you can't just sort of say, oh, I was traveling the world playing tennis. And then, you know, meanwhile, now you're like a top chef. What? 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 <laughs> tell, tell us about the tennis for a second here. You know, I, I want to know what happened. You dropped the ball because you grabbed the tortilla. What happened? <laughs> I traded a pan for a tennis racket. Right. Well, no, I mean, you know, I grew up in Mexico and, I, you know, I, I, you know, playing. I, I played nationally. Then I moved to Southern California to, you know, to play at, at Corona Mar High School in the top high schools. And I played collegiate at Texas Tech. And then I did the satellite circuit. And so tennis was, you know, my true, you know, you know, passion. And I wanted to become a professional tennis player. Around 18, I realized that, you know, it's, you know, it was a very tough, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the tallest guy around. So, you know, it, Who did it, it you was play? tough. Did you play anybody good? Yeah, I mean, I played Sampras, you know, wow. you know, he was in the same section. I played Agassi, you know, he was in Vegas. I was playing in California. Wow. So, I, you know, I was around a lot of these, you know, you know top players. But, I, I, you know, around 18, I had to make a decision whether to go teach tennis or, you know, find a different career. And like I said, being exposed with my grandmother to all these, you know, you know, wonderful ingredients and my father being in the restaurant industry in Acapulco, I said, you know, I think, you know, you know, food, I love food. I, you know, you know, I, I love, you know, the family you know, experience. And then just to just to touch on that, you know, I don't know, five years ago, we all started you know, talking about this family style kind of small plates. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've been doing that, you know, 40 years ago in an Indian cuisine in Mexican cuisine, you know, everything was, you know, you know, these small, you know, plates of, you know, 10 different dishes that we were getting experiencing in, you know, in our in, in our family. So, yeah, I mean, based on all those experiences that I had as a kid, I said, you know, you know, I think food is, you know, what I, what I, what I want to do and what I think will, you know, make me happy. And yeah, and the rest is history. No, amazing. Amazing. I, you know, it's, 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 it's one thing to be, you know, great at one thing, but to have had, you know, the opportunity to have been at, at you know, at the high end of tennis, which is a very competitive sport, and then to move into food and then do as well as you've done. Congratulations on, on many achievements in your life. And, Thank you. you know, no, of course. Uh, you know, I'd love to know about your creative process because you know, you you have. You know, what what does it take to create a dish and create something new? Because it's one thing to obviously bring up grandma's old recipes and things like that. And you know, a lot of people when they go to a Mexican restaurant, you know, they go for the same thing they've had always, right? But there are, you know, we, but you also create new dishes and bring in new flavors. And you like you talked about fusion. What is your creative process, and how do you you know create a new menu? Okay, so first of all, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always researching, you know, you know, new ingredients, um, you know, you know, when I travel, I, I go to new restaurants and see what you know, chefs are doing um, you know, to get inspired, um, you know, but, you know, to me, a, a dish, you know, and the way I, I explain it, I think uh, it makes sense to people is so, so, so my dish is, is, is the theater, right? It's my canvas, you know, so, so you have this white canvas and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to create uh, you know, a, a production. So then I take my protein, you know, what's my protein going to be, you know, and, and, and again, that's, that's, that's my main character, right? And so, you know, when, when I do that, then I think, so now, now I got to complement it with, you know, other actors, but we cannot forget side of the fact that, you know, 
you know, we're paying this main guy a lot of money to, you know, to be in our, in our dish. So, so let, let, let's not, you know, forget about him. So then I start bringing out, you know, the, the, the different ingredients, you know, to complement my main, you know, my, my main actor in my dish. Then I, you know, obviously my style is bold, you know, I love Latin flavor. So, so then I, I think about, you know, how each you know, ingredient is going to complement, you know, my, my main actor. And then I think about textures, you know, so, so, okay. So now I got, you know, my protein, I've got my, you know, my side uh, ingredients, my, uh, you know, um, other actors, how, how do I make this thing, you know, be bold, you know, be visually, you know, attractive and balanced. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, that, that's my thought process when I, you know, when I, when I create a dish. Amazing. No, I love the, uh, the, the theatrical references, you know, but, but it, but it makes sense a hundred percent. You know, it's, uh, oftentimes, you, you know, you, you, sometimes when people make food, you, you, if something has too much flavor and it's in the vegetables, you're, you're shoving someone's attention, you know, over to, you know, especially if it's too hot, right? If it's something is too spicy uh, and what have you. Um, no, I, I love that. Do you have a, a favorite dish? Yeah, I mean, I, I love ceviches. You know, I think ceviches are, you know, you know, mm. yeah, I, I love, you know, I love sushi, um, you know, so, you know, ceviche to me is like a sushi with flavor. You know, I, I like, you know, I like the, you know, the health aspect of it, you know, you know it's, it's healthy. I like the freshness of it. I like the cleanliness of it, um, you know, and, and again, I think with ceviche, you know, just like I was talking, it's very important, you know, to be able to, you know, contrast and, and you know, pick the, the right fish for the right sauce. I mean, and, and again, there's a lot of different types of ceviches, right? In Peru, you have leche de tigre, which, you know, every, every ceviche, you know, is based around leche de tigre. In Mexico, you know, I don't, you know we use mostly acid, you know, but again, you can use acid from a tomatillo, you know, you can put a tomatillo through it, through a juicer and use, you know, the, the juice, which has acid from the tomatillo. So there's, there's many ways to kind of think about how you build a ceviche you know, keeping in mind that you need, you know, the acid, you need, you need a little bit of heat and you need, and you need texture. I, I love a ceviche and it's funny, you're right. I mean, I also love sushi and I love sashimi and, but you're but absolutely, it's often the, the soy sauce and the, the ginger and the wasabi and the, the balance of those things that bring that piece of sashimi to, to life, you know, other than right. the fact that, you know, if it's cut well and it's a great piece of fish, but you're right. A ceviche is something which, is a, an absolute delight and you know I, I oftentimes you know you 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 know you'll get served ceviche in various restaurants so right? that'll be something that you that isn't whether it's a, a mexican restaurant or not ceviche could well be on the menu i didn't i wasn't even i don't think i even realized that ceviche was in fact mexican is that a is that a mexican thing is it or is it universal as a mexican i I'll tell you, yes, it's Mexican, but if you talk to a Peruvian, you'll say it's Peruvian. So it's Latin. It's Latin one way or another. It's Latin one, I think, one way or another. Yeah, and then yeah, I mean, you, you know, you, you go to Spanish and you're there through those. You know, so I, I think that you know, there's many guises to it in different cultures. At the end of the day, it's, it's almost the same thing, but they call it you know, you know different name. I mean, a crudo. I mean, you know, they just do olive oil, you know, a little bit of you know lime juice. Uh, a little bit of balsamic or whatever and again i mean it's it's similar to a ceviche so i, I think yeah uh, you know each culture has their own version of what you know well, they do is. they do i mean i grew up in you know in the uk and i know that smoked salmon which is you know not ceviche or you know you know it, it, sashimi when it's served with lemon juice salt pepper and you know perhaps some cayenne pepper across the top you know, is a delight and is is a version of this same concept of a sort of a, a sort of a, a you know a raw fish type of scenario, although it's smoked. But you know, that it's it's cut thin, it's and it's very delicate and it's healthy and full of flavor and what have you. And you know, I guess everywhere has its own version. You know, I guess well, you know. But sorry to interrupt you, but you know, what I what I've been surprised is you know, in Indian cuisine, they, they don't have anything like that. No crudos or anything. So that, that that always kind of blew my mind that they haven't kind of you know, embrace that. Uh, but yeah, in Indian food, you don't, you don't see, you know, any, any interpretation of a, you know, tiradito or a, a ceviche or anything. But it's anyway, funny. I'm sure they'll figure it out. Well, in general, I mean, in general, fish is not a, is not a, a, a big thing on the menus, you know, so yeah. you know, it's, and it's, and I always say too, when I, you know, in India and what have you, it's that 
I don't really go for the meat dishes there either, right? So, you know, the best, the, the quality of the meat, they don't have access to. And, you know, one of the things that they are very, very good at is vegetarian food, right? So if you are a veggie, Indian food is a great way to go because the, the flavor profiles are off the hook. So if you're worried about boring vegetarian food or vegan food, you know, Indian or even Mexican, because the same thing, the, the flavors are so fantastic. And, you know, these are people who have certainly the poor people, the sort of, the, you know, the average poor person is going to be living on dal, lentils, which is like beans and rice, right? It's the same, it's the right. same thing. It's, a, you know, that's the staple. And so how do you make that exciting for people? How do you change it up? You know, what are you going to do to really make it something special? And, you know, obviously in Sri Lanka, they use a lot of coconut versus the sort of ghee and clarified butter and, and what have you that they use in India. You know, so there's a sort of subtle difference there. But um, even in Sri Lanka, there's not, there are very few fish dishes that you'll come across, you know. And I think they're onto something because, you know, as we know today, I mean, you know, plant base is going to continue, you know, you know, to grow year over year. And I, you know, I heard a statistic that by 2025, they say, I mean, I think, you know, kind of beef will kind of flatten out and, and you know, plant base will, you know, kind of skyrocket. So what do you I think, think of that? What do you th have you tried? You know all these Impossible Burgers and Beyond Burgers, and I hear now that they are making you know meat genetically that will be basically like a steak that you can grow in a lab, and it's it's going to be a steak. What do you think of that? I think it's a little crazy. I mean, it does. You know, it's it's a little weird. I mean, I, I love plant based. You know, you know, some companies are, are using hemp, they're using soy. That I'm okay with, but I, you know, I I don't know enough about all this molecular. Kind of you know laboratory you know made you know proteins but uh i mean uh, I, yeah I, I i don't have a, a, a i don't have enough information yet to make a decision either way it's coming one way or the other i mean i know there's exactly. multiple groups of people doing it and you know there's certainly when we look at the, the number of cows in this in in the us and what cattle is doing and we look think about the environment there's there's definitely yeah. uh, an argument for it I agree. I mean, I, I think it sounds extraordinarily alien and, you know, rather scary. And who knows what the ramifications are in the long term if you're going to eat something like that. You know, one thing I noticed coming from the UK to the US, very, it was very evident to me, was that American men were far bigger than English men, just in all ways. They were just bigger, much larger right. people, much... And, and, you know, when I first started, when I first moved to the US, I was a sort of skinny Englishman. And and after sort of 10 years, I noticed a con, con, you know, I was distinctly different. And, and I realized that I think it was a lot of the steroids in the meat that had right. was physically changing the shape of me. And not that I was becoming necessarily fat or heavy in that way, but the the, the musculature of my body, the, the, the way I was developing, I just I went back to the UK and I just looked different to my friends. And, you know, we really didn't do much. I mean, we were all eating similar stuff. You know, these guys have big appetites too in the UK. It wasn't like they weren't eating and drinking. They can, but we look different. And I don't know what, that was the only thing I could pinpoint it to was the fact that there must be steroids in the meat. Is that something, you know, where do you source all your food from and everything? Are you careful about, you know, what, where you're getting your produce and does that matter to you so much? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think we try to go local as much as we can. Um, and I think, like you said, I mean, try and source foods that are, you know, with, you know, less hormones, less steroids. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I mean, it does affect the body. Uh, you know, me personally, I mean, I, I eat very little beef today. I mean, maybe, you know, once or twice a month, but I mean, I've gone mostly towards, you know, a fish and a plant-based diet and I feel it, you know, I do, I do feel better. Um, you know, digesting meat is not easy as you, as you get older, it becomes harder and harder. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, I mean, you know, whatever fuel you put in your body is, you know, it's like a car, you know, whether you're going to run smooth or, you know, you're going to struggle. And, and, and I'm seeing now that I've cut down on, on, on beef, you know, I do for sure feel better. Yeah, absolutely. As, as, as do I actually doing similar things. And that's an interesting thing. The older we get people, a lot of things change. So, you know, <laughs> The amount of meat you can eat, the amount of drink you can drink, all those things. So just be careful, be good to yourself. Now, your restaurants, they, they, they're, they're not just a food, it's an experience. You know, you, you're into music, DJs, you've got, you know, all kinds of things going on in them. It's, you know, and I know you've, you're big on Day of the Dead and, and you had, you've just had some great Day of the Dead celebrations and, you know, you do special things. Um, talk to us about the music concept. Why is music so important for you? And what do you try, what kind of tone are you trying to set in the restaurants? 
I mean, I, and I always say this, I mean, I think today, you know, you know, restaurants are a lot, it's a lifestyle, right? You know, when I first started, you know, started, you know, my, you know, my, my own restaurants was, I don't know, what, 30 some years ago. And, you know, it was all about the food, you know, you, you know, mixology, you know, didn't really exist. It was all the classic cocktails. It was the wine, you know, and I allocated a small part of my restaurant to the bar. It was all about the food and, and, and the dining experience. You know, I think today it's, it's a lifestyle, you know, and I think if you don't hit all the elements, you know, I think food today is, you know, back then I thought, I think it was 80% of the experience. I think today, you know, it's 50% of the experience. I think it's the music, the mixology, you know, everything else. I think people, when they go out to eat today, they're looking for all these, you know, you know, senses, you know, for everything, you know, in your body, you know, you know, your, your, your ears, you know, your eyes, you know, your, your palate, your nose. I think it's, it's, they're looking for, for, you know, an experience. And so you have to hit all these different, you know, elements. So, yeah, so I, you know, I slowly, you know, I, I opened my first restaurant, you know, 10 years ago with, you know, with, with DJs and it was just kind of starting at that time. You know, people thought I was crazy. And, you know, today, you know, most restaurants have, you know, they transition, you know, you know, throughout the night, you know, music gets louder and people start having more fun. I mean, you know, you know, it can't be a stuffy experience where, you know, you're sitting there, you know, for two hours, you know, having a, you know, 25, you know, course, you know, you know, meal where, you know, it's just your palate. I think today, you know, you got to set the tone with, you know, with everything else, you know, design, lighting, music, you know, mixology. I think people are looking for all these sensory, sensory experiences. It's almost like a circus. I mean, you know, when you listen yeah. to all the things that you're mentioning, it really is, you, you, to your point, a lifestyle. You're going in there to, to, to turn on everything that you can at once, or, or but it, but it have to do it subtly. And it, it's it, people don't realize that, that necessarily the music is getting louder throughout the evening. They just perhaps feel that the the place is filling up and it's getting you know more boisterous and a little bit more exciting and and what have you. And there's this sort of crescendo moment, right? And, and yeah. that's that. You know, I mean, is it hard to keep a restaurant relevant? And I ask that because I know that, you know, there's a lot of turnover in restaurants. It's not easy to keep restaurants open long term. And a lot of, play, you know, you see in New York City, a restaurant will be open and there's a few, few and far between that are the ones which have been there for generations. And there's, you know, several that are open for five years, 10 years and then close and then they're done. You know, what, what do you do to stay relevant? You know, I think the most important thing is, you know, R&R, I mean, R&D, research, research and development. You know, we have an area in the company which is all about research and, and, and developing. Um, you know, you look at Maya, New York. You know, Maya, New York is 23 years old. You know, it's, you know that's, that's unusual for a restaurant in New York to last that long. But, you know, that restaurant's been remodeled, you know, four or five times. Um, you know, it's transitioned. You know, the, 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 the menu, you know, went from, you know, kind of very, you know, classic items to more, to more modern. So I think you have to continuously be evolving and changing and adapting. You know, you cannot sit on your laurels and say, oh, you know, I, I, you know and that's where people fail, that they think, yeah, you know, I've made it. No, you know, we haven't made it, you know, and until the day we die, you know, we, we have to continue striving to, you know, to, you know, to be better, um, you know, be socially conscious. I mean, I think there's a lot of elements that, that play into, you know, keeping your restaurants, you know, you know relevant and, and moving, I mean, you know, I think one of the most important things is, you know, is your employees. You know, I, I, I within the company, I've, I've had very little turnover. You know, the chef that's been that Maya's been there with me for, you know, twenty of those twenty three years, um, and so that's you know, consistency is a very important you know part you know of of, of what we do. So you got to got you got to take care of your employees. You know, happy employees. You know, happy customers. So I think there's a lot of little things that that you can do to making sure that. You know, you you stay relevant and you stay current, and you know you, you continuously are you know upgrading and, and updating. I love that. In fact, I I feel that that is literally what you last that last thing you said that is so important. I mean, I, I got to say from my own experience from living in Europe for many years, going back to Milan for example, and twenty years later and visiting several restaurants which were open twenty years ago, which were still open today. And actually seeing the same people waiting the tables 20 years on, right? Like that 
with for me and obviously a lot of these are family owned businesses but you know it's the fact that they, that was enough for them and that they enjoyed it and they were having a good happy life and working and it and it that's why I loved it back then and that's why I loved it again when I came back 20 years later and it it didn't need to necessarily completely reinvent it just needed to have that great feeling of great good food cooked with love served with care and people that were passionate about what they did and to, you know so that is I I I you yeah, know I think not enough is oftentimes in the US the restaurant business is is shortchanged with the concept of it being a a temporary job or something that perhaps you know I you know I, I want to be an actor but I'm a waiter right now so I'm going to learn my lines and you know here's the here's the menu and you know my best delivery but you know they don't really care or they haven't necessarily tried anything on it right yeah and I think it's st staying current means it means evolving not changing your DNA you know I, I, again you, you don't have to take a restaurant and completely change it because it's successful because people liked its essence you just got to evolve you know with, with the times and, 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 you know, the new, the new generations, you know, you gotta, you know, follow what, what they like and what they're doing. So I think you need to evolve, not completely, you know, change. A hundred percent. I'm talking about changing and evolving. I mean, obviously we, we live in a very digital world these days and you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of, everyone's a food critic, first of all, you know, what do you think of these, you know, influencers and bloggers and what have you, and, you know, everyone becoming a food critic and, and, you know, maybe, you know, getting in everyone's business and thinking they know what they're talking about. I mean, I, I think it's been craziness, uh, you know, obviously before you had reviewers and, you know, I think that the hardest thing for, at least for me is that, you know, restaurants, I think people don't understand how hard it is to open a restaurant. There's so many moving parts. You know, you know, from, you know, I mean, just when you walk into a restaurant, you know, so first you have to design a restaurant. So you're working with designers to making sure the lighting, the furniture, it's, it's, it all, it's all relevant. Then you start training, you know, you have to train a hostess, you know, with, with, with an open table. Then you have your bartenders, you know, and, and your barbacks, you know, with recipes. Then you go into the, you know, the bus boys, the waiters, then, you know, the recipes in the kitchen the cooks, and then there's a director that has to you know, orchestrate the, you know, the, the symphony to making sure everything is coming you know, at the same time. So there's so many you know, moving parts and people don't understand that. So for me to be able to get a fine tuned engine, you know, it takes three or four months. So before, you know, you used to have the New York Times or, or, or the Zagats, you know, it, 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 you would be reviewed over time. You know, they would say the New York Times usually never came in before two or three months. You know, now, you know, you get an influencer with, I don't know, a million followers that comes in and, and you know, your first day, you know, you know, he hits, you know, 500,000 people, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't understand that, you know, it takes us a long time to be able to create what we're doing. So, you know, I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, it's good in the sense that, you know, the word gets out really fast, but if you're not prepared, then, you know, it's, it's going to be a big problem. So what we've had to do is, is, is you know, is, is adapt to our, to our curves. And so whether before maybe, you know, we had a you know, two week training before we opened and then, you know, we slowly kind of evolved and, and you know, continue training with our soft opening. Now, you know, it, we, we, we take, you know, four weeks before we even open of training. So we've had to in, increase our training on the back and to be able to hit on the front end so so you know and, and what that that affects you know your budgets and it affects a lot of things so so yeah i, I think it's i think it's been challenging I, I think we've all learned to adapt um but yeah i mean i i liked it the old way better you know when you had two or three months to kind of get everything you know moving and, and circling so yeah it's, it's it's been challenging for me is it is it somewhat terrifying to see a food critic sitting at your table when do people recognize them and, and come up when there is a sort of well-known critic I mean, you see it in movies when someone sits in the table and the you know everyone's like oh look who it is it's so and so from whatever and you know and do you make extra good food or is it just the same <laughs> I mean I, I think it should be the same you know obviously you know I like to tell you know, everybody in the restaurant, I mean, when I, when I, when I come in just because, you know, I'm the owner, you know, I should not get a, get a different experience than, than, you know, the, the, you know, the guests, you know, guests next to me. But, but it's funny you say that because I remember, you know, when I opened my first restaurant in New York city, it was all about, you know, Ruth Reichel was, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the food critic for the New York times. And, you know, we had pictures of her posted everywhere in the restaurant with glasses, without glasses, with hat, with wigs, without wigs. You know, we wanted to know because we knew, she was either going to make us or break us, you know, and Maya New York at that point, I mean, you know, I remember we were doing about 35 covers a night, you know, when she came in, you know, we went from 30 to 250 for the next five years. So the impact was just tremendous. 
I mean, she would either really make her, they don't, you know, unfortunately they don't have the same impact today that, 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 that they did. I think social media is, has, is much more impactful today than, than, than food critics. There you go. That in itself is, is crazy. Uh, yeah. Chef Sandoval, thank you so much for your time. Before I let you go, I want, I, I want, I've got a couple of quick, fast little questions I'd love to ask you. Something we, we end the show with every time. It's called Last Orders. Favorite ingredients or ingredient? I think chilies. Really, chilies? Yeah. And, and why is that? Why, just because you like the spice or? Yeah, I, 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 just for me, I mean, you know, when, when I create dishes, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's so many different guises. I mean, you know, a jalapeno could also be a, a, a chipotle, you know, so just depending on how you use them and how, you know, I think they, they, you know, it's almost like a salt to me. It just brings out, you know, a lot of flavors in, 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 in the dishes that I create. In the movie of your life, who would you have play you? In the movie of my life, who would I have liked to have played? That's, that's, that's a tough one. But I would probably have to say, you know, Bjorn Borg. Wow. You know, the tennis player. That would be very cool. Amazing. Yeah. He's yeah, a classic he, himself, for sure. He, yeah, he was a classic. He was passionate, but he was humble. Um, and he was the best at, 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 you know, at, his, at his career. And he had great hair. He had great hair, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which, let's not forget the hairband and the hair. I, 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 I remember for all of you uh, the, who are too young to remember, go check out Bjorn Borg and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a kind of a mixture between Chef Sandoval and Abba. Um, <laughs> final question for you, shaken or stirred? Stern. Stirred, really. And why is that? I just I, you know, I, I'd like to keep the process you know I, I just i keep like you know I keep putting my head down and just kind of moving forward you know nice fantastic chef I, I know you've got many different restaurants have you anything coming up anything that's opening in the near future what should we yeah be you know we're, yeah we're working on a, quite a few projects right now we have a, a beach club opening up in athens in april uh, you know we have a beach club in cabo san lucas opening in uh in mexico in uh in november um yeah, I think those are our two. You know. And where can everyone go to to find out what your the latest news and and you know where all your restaurants are? You know, they can go into you know um, Richard Sandoval Hospitality into our website. I think um, you know we we have a newsletter also there, kind of uh, you know updating what we're doing, where we're doing, and you know what's happening in our world. Fantastic, and everyone out there at Shaken and Stirred on Instagram, we will put the, the link to Chef Sandoval's uh, website in the, when this episode airs. So, so obviously look out for that. Um, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate having you on. It's been a real insight into your world. Uh, and I, I'm hungry now. Again, I told everyone at the beginning of the show, you're gonna get hungry, so you know, get ready. Um, they needed a tortilla to sop up they, you know, their, their tequila. Real pleasure. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything and, and all the best. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate Absolutely. it. All the best. Yeah. Take care. Right. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with a, another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya.